Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like you to raise, to raise up, to get up. Up, everybody. <laughs> and uh, we'll soon start this uh, session with the medical associations uh, here. And uh, I'd like to welcome the two uh, uh, panelists, Dr. Ulrich Montgomery from uh, Germany. I'll I tell you in a minute. I'll tell you soon. <laughs> and um, Dr. Christine Roman from uh, Switzerland. Uh, Christine uh, is from the board of the um, uh, Medical Association in Switzerland and uh, uh, Montgomery is uh, the president for the Bundesärztekammer. Um, and I will soon start. Uh, we have until four o'clock. We were talking about the challenges earlier and uh, I will uh, um, take my, um, the opportunity to mention one of our challenges where we fail in Sweden. Because once the refugees come to Sweden, we put them in refugee uh, centers, and we are very proud that we managed to do so, you know, get shelter. But then we let them wait for months and months and months in passivity. And one of the biggest challenges for health is uh, the, the lack of physical activity, and uh, combined with uh, unsecureness of whether they can stay or not, and they will sit passive and wait. Imagine what that do to people. And uh, physical activity is very important, and we uh, fail uh, to, uh, well, make it possible for them to be in physical activity in our refugee centers in Sweden. So, but now you'll be sitting the whole day, and uh, now you get the chance to move a little bit, and you will feel better and have a, a better attention to the panelists. So now we'll sit down. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> Montgomery, <laughs> the floor is yours. Well, thank, thank you very much. Now, don't expect me to take you dancing uh, uh, the rest of the day. I have been asked to give you a brief overview of uh, the situation on migration in my home country, Germany. And you have heard a lot of the background and of the basics uh, already in the morning session because the situation in Sweden and in uh, Germany in many aspects is very similar. Uh, I would like to give, you, uh, to, have a, to give you four points. First, I would like to talk uh, on some statistics because we do need some data. Secondly, I would like uh, to talk on the reaction of the medical societies and the medical profession as a whole. Thirdly, I would like to give you a brief outlook uh, and I would like to extend my, uh, my agenda to a small outlook into a change of the societal situation in our country because I think that is important as well. And finally, I would like to give you some brief comments on what can we do as medical profession to change the situation, to improve the situation and to live up to the standards which we have given ourselves uh, which are so important. And I would d deeply like to endorse what uh, Sir Michael Marmot said this morning. Doctors should be in the lead to deliver services with dignity. This is one of our most uh, obvious but also most important uh, obligations. And one of the first and prime objects is however society discusses these matters, whatever politicians say, we are the people that don't ask why someone came to the country where I am delivering my services. There is no prejudice for any patient that I see, and I demand of my government to give me the right and the possibility to live up to my ethical implications which are laid down not only in Hippocrates' oath, but even in more modern regimes uh, within the different uh, societies. We will not talk, and I will definitely not talk, of the prevention of causes that have led people to come to European countries. We have done that this morning, and it would extend uh, the mission of my motion, of my, uh, my intervention, far too much. I, I will only talk about uh, some things that happened in Germany. Germany, numerically, is still the country that has taken the most though not the heaviest load. Sweden has taken more, Austria has taken more per capita, 
but Germany has taken the heaviest load of refugees in the last year. I myself am on the advisory board of Chancellor Merkel uh, on this uh, situation, and I can give you the latest figures as of uh, 1st of January. Germany in 2015 ex accepted 1,091,894 migrants. 476,649 of these, so that is approximately 45%, have asked for asylum in the German Republic. Now, you will ask immediately why is there a gap uh, of uh, uh, almost 50% or more than 50% between people crossing the border and being registered as uh, refugees uh, and only 500,000, approximately 500,000 asking for asylum. This simply has to do with the German efficiency. Uh, the asylum process, as it has been laid out to some extent by Professor Herr Schuelz, very similar in Germany, is so complicated uh, that up to now, the officials have only taken up the, um, the asylum, uh, about 50% of the asylum seekers. The others are still waiting in first reaction camps to be assessed, to be taken, to be sort of brought into the bureaucratic process. So we expect that by the end uh, uh, of uh, this bureaucratic process, approximately one million people will have applied for asylum in the Federal Republic of Germany. And already in January this year, there have been 50,000 new refugees coming into the country. And at the present time, where the weather is slightly improving, we see more and more uh, refugees coming into the country as well. And I'm going to talk uh, later, just briefly, on the societal situation that that has changed. Now, what did we do as a medical profession? We had to assess that when in, in August, September, our Chancellor Merkel, seeing what happened in the train stations in Hungary, in Budapest, opened the German borders and said, let them all come. We sent trains to Hungary to bring the refugees from Hungary and through Slovenia and Austria into Germany. Uh, to, um, when that happened, our public health service collapsed completely. That is nothing to say against our colleagues in the public health service, but the government during the last 20 years has diminished public health services to an extent that everyone was completely taken unawares when this influx of uh, patients and influx of people came into our country. Immediately, the medical profession took up uh, this challenge, and uh, for instance, in the home country of Hamburg, where I live and practice, uh, within one night, uh, we, it was just one simple email and phone call to some physicians. In one night, we recruited 450 people, 150 physicians that helped voluntarily uh, in the camps, that helped voluntarily in the first reaction uh, units. Uh, the idea was we did not want to have one big camp with, say, 200,000 people. No, we wanted to have them spread out over the society, spread out over the area of a city like Hamburg, because uh, that prevents uh, what we call ghettoisierung, the, the sort of bringing them into ghettos and bringing more social problems by amalgamating different ethnic groups, different religions, different cultures, because that causes a big problem for people that are, as Heidi just said very, very well, that are sort of deemed to sit and wait passively whatever happens. The process, the bureaucratic process at this moment is about 15 months until a, a final decision is made whether a refugee has, is, uh, is accepted as an asylum seeker or whether he has to be repatriated, whatever that means, we've heard about that. I'm not going to indulge on that. The medical profession at the same time, and we've done that long before this crisis, fiercely interacted with the government on the German legislation on asylum, on, on health care provisions to asylum seekers. We have a uh, and even a whole uh, law on this with a um, name which is impossible to translate into any other language because it's bureaucratic German. But in this Asylbewerberleistungsgesetz, it is said that asylum seekers and refugees only receive immediate acute treatment and treatment for pain. 
that in a rich country like Germany is abominable. And we have fought this since the early 80s when this law was introduced. And I must say that in many contracts between chambers and healthcare insurers, who pay actually for the treatment of the refugees, uh, we have found reasons, we have found ways around this uh, type of uh, legislation. I can tell you in my home country, we, in Hamburg, we made a contract saying that it is to totally ridiculous if you see a patient coming for pain and you diagnose diabetes, to wait until this diabetes is in an acute situation, you have to treat it right away. We have to take that on our medical oath and we did so, and we achieved at least a fair amount of better treatment for refugees and asylum seekers. However, we are confronted with great problems which we hadn't seen before. Uh, Apostolos mentioned detention camps. Now, I wouldn't call the first reaction units in Germany detention camps. However, I saw for the first time in my medical life 500 people being infected with scabies. I hadn't seen that before, and in the past you, had some, you sometimes saw one person who had scabies. And then you knew that with certain ointments and, uh, you, can, you can treat, I'm a radiologist, so I'm not a specialist on this, so you may excuse that. You can treat scabies, but how do you treat 500 people? You have to burn their clothes, you have to burn their nightwear, you have to burn all the things, and you have to treat them with drugs. These drugs were not even available in Germany. They had to be imported from France because there was no stock of anti-scabies drugs in Germany any longer. <laughs> so you see, it is our responsibility to make sure that problems of this type don't turn up in a rich country like Germany. At the same time, and please don't take that as a contradiction, looking at the refugees. We found they are much healthier than the average German population. Now that is easy to say because Germany has a demographic problem and refugees tend to be young male. About 70% uh, of the refugees are young male in, between, in the age between 15 and 30. And of course they come with acute infections, of course they come with wounds, of course they come with deprivation from starvation and hunger, which they experience over the three-month um, three uh, flight. Uh, of course they also have the problem, psych psychologic problem, even psychiatric problem, the uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome is very common in these. But generally they are much healthier than the average German population. So, we insisted immediately, and I think we are on a good track that, that by integrating them into the ordinary German healthcare process and not setting up special medical teams, but simply saying they have to get an electronic health card which gives them access to all medical services in the country and think about how to pay for it later is the only way how we can treat them under our Hippocratic oath and under good medical conditions. This we have achieved in some states of Germany, as many, some of you may know, Germany is a federal republic, and we have differences in our country as well. There is a small, no, there is a large state in the south of Germany that is always against everything, so they have not yet introduced the electronic health card for uh, refugees, but most northern countries, most northern states have done so, and this alleviates uh, uh, the problem tremendously, and actually it even saves a lot of money, because the bureaucratic process of allowing all those without the card to go to a doctor costs a lot of bureaucracy. By just giving them a healthcare card and letting them flow into the normal system, we in Hamburg saved 11 million euros in one year simply on bureaucratic processes. This has to be said as well uh, if you talk about uh, these things. However, we have to make sure that the typical conditions of people crammed into close uh, conditions with language and cultural problems uh, do not overwhelm the problem. We have to find ways of getting faster access to uh, to definite asylum situations and, and here I may have a little bit of a contrast to Apostolos, 
we have to find ways of those who are definitely considered as non-asylants of repatriation. Now that might seem peculiar to you, but we should not forget at the beginning of 2015, 40% of the refugees that came to us were people from what we call the West Balkan, Kosovo, Albania, Montenegro, and obviously they were from came for uh, for not for def not for definite uh, um, life risks, but for more economic reasons. And it is the right of a state also to consider that you have to set your priorities. If you want to save lives, you have to save lives. And therefore, this has changed completely, actually. At the present time, only 2% of refugees come from these countries. 40% of the refugees come from Syria, but 15 from Afghanistan, 10 from Iraq, and the other from all over the world. Now, third topic, societal change. We have uh, experienced a tremendous societal change. When in August our chancellor has opened uh, the border, there was what we called a welcome culture in our country. The largest part of the whole society welcomed the refugees. There were parties made for refugees. There was uh, this feeling that we as Germans could help these people and to give them a chance and give them a future. This, over the last half year, I have to say, has changed completely. As most of you may have noticed from the press and from international communication, our Chancellor is in a difficult position because um, there are big parts in Europe, other states in Europe, but also within our own country that see it as a problem to, expect, to accept refugees and that want to build up big fences and big walls and, um, ex and make sure refugees cannot come to Germany any longer. So what is it, ladies and gentlemen, that we did or more better, better more, more important, what can we do? First of all, of course we have to organize, we have to help organize acute and intermediate interventions. So we are still responsible as the medical profession. We did it with our uh, voluntary colleagues, but you have to ac accept that you cannot organize a problem like that on voluntary basis for years and years and years. Voluntary interventions are good for a beginning, for a start, but then you have to have some sort of structure and you have to have some sort of people who are paid for it who are doing it. Um, to are doing it full time. Secondly, you have to intervene politically. We do that in our country. Of course, we are just as successful as with all other political interventions, and that means it is very often a matter of definition whether you are fully uh, successful or not. Uh, most doctors are never happy with what they've got, so I must say we're never fully uh, successful, but we do get some success in organizing uh, some laws, and at the present time, for instance, we're quite um, uh, we're ho hoping to change even some of the uh, health application laws uh, towards refugees. Secondly, uh, we have to make sure that there is no second-class management uh, of healthcare problems of refugees. We had earlier on this discussion on accepting Syrian doctors. Uh, for instance, that uh, say themselves they are doctors and let them treat only Syrians or only other refugees. We do not believe in this concept. We have sufficient doctors in our country and we have the Directive 2005-36 of the European Union which defines what the qualification of a doctor must be. Uh, whoever can qualify after this Directive will immediately also get a license to practice in Germany, but we do not want to have second class physicians with a lower quality assessment who will only treat their own group. I will tell you why, because we've had an experience in our country. This was exactly what 70 years ago, or 80 years ago actually, the then government of Germany did with Jewish physicians. They were only allowed to treat Jews and not other people, and this is something we do not want to have in our country again. Where you have a doctor, he can treat all patients. If someone cannot qualify under the law of the European Union, then we will not, uh, we will not uh, want him to uh, 
um, to, to practice as a doctor. However, we changed the law and made it possible that these are helping doctors as medical assistants because they are very important for both, uh, uh, for both cultural and language uh, communication. Uh, the fourth uh, point, um, or the final point that uh, I think is uh, very important, and we had a big conference in Germany at the beginning of this week in the Bundeserzekammer, we have to bring together the NGOs and the government, because I sometimes see it is so difficult, the communication between NGOs and government, uh, and we have started a conference. Uh, the idea is that we have to set a standard of prerequisites or priorities. What do you have to do if a doctor wants to go and help in any of these situations? We have to have contractual arrangements between governments and NGOs, contractual arrangements for work conditions for doctors, health, uh, other healthcare professionals as well, not only doctors. All this cannot be reinvented every time a humanitarian, man-made, or uh, other crisis uh, appears, we have to be aware of all these things. And I think uh, if we do all this together, we will have a fair chance of coping with this crisis as well, notwithstanding the problem that, of course, the problem lies not in Europe. The problem lies where the people go away from, not where they go to. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Montgomery. And uh, now I pass the word to uh, Dr. Christine Roman from Switzerland. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you so much that I have the opportunity to contribute a little bit to this um, meeting and with this um, very important tasks. Um, I, I think the situation is quite similar as in Sweden and in Germany. Um, but with, uh, some spaces, uh, something is with things that are not like there. Um, Switzerland is a small country too. Uh, we have about eight um, millions of inhabitants, a quarter of it, by the way, foreigners. And uh, the cantons are in charge of the health care system in our country. The federal government organizes the registration of the refugees in five so called reception centers and their distribu distribution into the cantons. As you mentioned before, in Sweden or in Germany, people stay quite long in these reception centers for weeks or even months, and they have nothing to do there, then wait. Uh, when it comes to numbers, where are we there in Switzerland? In 2015, we also had a sig significant increase in the number of refugees at something around 40,000, the number was nearly as high as in 1998 and 1999, when more than 5,000 refugees from the Balkans crossed our borders within 18 months. And finally, we could deal with that too. Well, compared with the European, what we heard this morning uh, and, and the this uh, afternoon, as you said this morning, uh, we face some uh, minor challenges probably, but we face them anyway and uh, minor challenges are also challenges. And of course there is a lot, lot of, uh, that could be improved in Switzerland too. But uh, uh, the federal government has uh, decided that there is not, uh, it's not necessary to activate a special emergency scenarios um, maybe this year this will change when things continue the way they do. We have a lot of refugees from Eritrea uh, since years. This is uh, the biggest number. Sri Lanka, Somalia and Afghanistan. Only in November and December of the last year the first refugees from Syria started to arrive in Switzerland. Refugees, of course, have access to our health system. In the reception centers, a nurse takes care of them. They have to fill a questionnaire. We are in Switzerland, everybody has to fill out some formula. They have to fill out a questionnaire about uh, their health in general and uh, about tuberculosis in particular. And they, they see a doctor if they need treatment immediately. 
Uh, this uh, sounds very good. In practice, it's not always easy, but it seems that it works quite well. Then they go to the cantons, to the next uh, place to wait. And uh, I would like to present, to present to you the concept of health care for refugees in the canton of Watt as, uh, I think, a good example, maybe the best we have in Switzerland. And here, too, the refugees get a health check by a specialized Unité de Soins aux Migrants. It's a French-speaking canton, uh, so it's a care unit, kind of a care unit. Uh, this unit is part of a network health and migrants where about 170 family doctors and pediatricians are available for the network. The nurse checks their health status, asks for the vacation records and does a triage given, uh, according to a given algorithm. Until now, the system has worked pretty well. The nurses could handle about 70% of all the cases themselves. 30% needed further treatment. The system was planned for about 100 refugees a month. But towards the end of 2050, more than 300 people arrived every month. And the system had to switch in a kind of emergency mode all activities like health promotion or prevention had to be stopped. Utilizing nurses as a first triage stage seems to be a good model for caretaking and is now being discussed in other cantons as well. Well, what uh, difficulties do we face when we uh, try to treat people, refugees? Communications with patients from uh, different cultures and uh, with different languages are always diff difficult and sometimes um, is made more so by difficulties in accessing good translation services. Furthermore, doctors have to cope with various diseases. As you mentioned before, they don't very see often in Switzerland um, uh, out of specialized centers for uh, tropic diseases. So it's, um, for instance, tuberculosis, as I mentioned before, bilharziosis, malaria, in addition to the injuries from the exhausting journey, including sometimes injuries from sexual relation during the journey. I think doctors have to be open-minded and um, be aware that women get violated not only by uh, military, by soldiers or politicians or uh, their enemies in their country, but also by their fellow refugees. Where there is no protections, women have to fear for their life or for their personal integrity. And sometimes men too. And the special treatment is the treatment of scabies, as you mentioned, and in Switzerland, the, the most effective drugs are not registered. They are available, but they're not registered, so it, uh, you have to, it, it requires a special procedure to get it. Gynecological treatment, including counseling for contraception for women living in very patriarchal family structures, is reported to be a difficult issue, and poor dental, poor, uh, dental health is also a concern. As you heard this morning already several times, a lot of refugees suffer from mental health problems like post-traumatic stress disorders, anxiety, depression. Since the 90s, we have a treatment centers for um, vict uh, victims of torture and war. In the 90s, when we had all these refugees from the Balkans, the first one started in Geneva, I think. Today, we have five centers offering treatment and counseling and helping refugees to cope with the consequences of what they have experienced. The center work together in an association called Support for Torture Victims, and they also do a lot of public, re public relation work to promote an understanding of these traumatized people. The association published a brochure on post-traumatic stress disorder that helps people, the patients themselves, but also everybody who has to deal with them, to understand more about the sometimes very strange symptoms of this disease. This brochure is actually available in 10 languages so that it covers not all, but most of the countries where the refugees come from. 
Um, we also have a lot of NGOs in Switzerland taking care of refugees, um, and some of them in the field of health in a broader sense. And I would like to present one of them who won a prize of health literacy in 2012. Uh, I had the honor of being part of the jury that uh, assessed the projects, and I must say I liked the winner very much. It's a project of the HEX, it's an organization of the Protestant Church, um, who provides refugee women with a piece of garden. Many of these women had a garden or a piece of land and were used to gardening, to farming, and therefore they are familiar with gardening but of course they lack access to land here in Switzerland. And therefore Hex leases a pieces, pieces of land and gives it to the women and helps them to work on it. They get, it, they get out of their house, which is uh, their house, what, wherever they are. Uh, they meet other women in similar situations. They have to speak German with the helpers and with each other or French in the French part of Switzerland. They get information about healthy food, about um, uh, health ser services if they need, and uh, of, this, of the health system in general, if required. And the prize helped, the, pro helped the, the project to get installed all over Switzerland, so we have now uh, 26 sites all over the country. So these are the minor challenges we're dealing with, and uh, at the moment it, it looks like we have the resources to take care of the refugees in a quite reasonable way, except for, for the psychiatric problems, as I mentioned before. As a psychiatrist myself, I have to, uh, to admit that uh, we're, it's far from sufficient what we do for refugees uh, in, in concerning their mental health. Of course, we have in Switzerland all these uh, sometimes pretty ugly discussions about uh, where refugees come and why they come and how they are and how dangerous they are. All these things we have uh, heard a lot about this, the, the whole day. But um, until now, I think uh, uh, we can work it. But uh, nobody knows how things will develop. Everybody is uh, dreading spring and summer when all the boats come over the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, if the European Union does not find a solution to distribute the refugees all over Europe in a fair way, things will get worse in Switzerland too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Roman. Um, and um, then I asked you, uh, do you have any questions to the participants here? Yeah, there were one. I can see there are similarities uh, between our countries, definitely. Mm -hmm. And also the average time for, for the process, the asylum process is about the same. And, evet. and also the challenges. Yes. Ee, Alman hükümetinin e, Alman Tabipler Birliği Başkanı'nda yaptıkları uyumlu, güzel çalışmadan dolayı öncelikle teşekkür ediyorum. Avrupa'nın pek çok ülkesinde evet. ee, Alman hükümeti ile Alman Tabipler Birliği'nin ortaklaşa yürüttükleri çalışmalarda oldukça iyi bir uyum görüyoruz. Ee, Tabipler Birliği Başkanımızın yaptığı açıklamalarda. Öncelikle teşekkür ediyorum. Avrupa'da pek çok ülkenin mültecilerden bu kadar kaçarken Almanya'nın bir milyona yakın bir mülteciyi kabul etmesi takdire değer bir davranıştı. Teşekkür ediyorum mülteciler adına. Ayrıca ülkemizde e, Tayyipler Birliği ile Sağlık Bakanlığı'nın yetkilileri arasında bu konuda e, mültecilerle yapılacak sağlık hizmetleri konusunda hiçbir uyum göremiyoruz. Ancak Almanya'daki bu uyumla Türkiye'deki durumu karşılaştırdığımız zaman verilecek hizmetin kalitesindeki düşüşün nedeni ortaya çıkıyor aslında. Çünkü sivil toplum kuruluşları bu hizmetin içinde değiller. Bakanlık tek başına bir şeyler yapmaya çalışıyor. Ve ben kendim pediatristim. Çalıştığım hastanede mültecilere verilecek sağlık hizmetleri konusunda bakanlığın ne bir bilgilendirmesi ne bir eğitiminden geçtik. Tercüme oldukça ciddi bir sorun. Çocukların yaşadıkları enfeksiyon hastalıklar, mültecilerin 
e, yüksek doğurgan e, hızıyla karşı karşıya kalıp devamlı doğum yapmaları da ayrı bir sorun. Almanya'da ki mültecilerde bu yüksek doğurganlığı görüyor musunuz? Bu sizi tedirgin ediyor mu? Teşekkür ediyorum. As to the compliance in Germany and in your country, you have to leave this question to my diplomacy now, how I'm going to express this. In Germany, the, the chambers, the medical professional organizations are self-regulated bodies under government supervision. We are allowed to organize ourselves, therefore we have to deliver something to society and we interact. Now let the compliance between the government and the medical profession not take you too far. We are in opposition to the government quite often and we do not always get what we want. So that I think is fairly similar to many other countries. But it is a good concept that it has to do with the subsidiarity idea that the people that are closest to the problem should solve the problem and not distant governments in Berlin or somewhere else. As to the second question, I simply have to pass. I have no idea what the birth rate uh, amongst refugees is. I simply cannot answer you this question. Are there... I just asked the audience, are there any other ones who know the birth rate in the... <laughs> by the no. I, I, before I pass the word down there to you, I can tell that in, in Sweden I don't have any numbers either. Um, we, we do have the situation though that uh, the vast majority of the refugees are male, so there is an imbalance. I think you would have to look sort of, a, of on a certain fraction to look at the birth rate. We have nothing to do with birth rate. Uh, oh, oh, you do, you do, but you know, this, this has to be a certain <laughs> case mix uh, to, to do the calculation. Oh, it's, oh, okay, I'll pass that on <laughs> to the colleague down there. In, in the red uh, down there. Teşekkür ederim. Katılımcıların sunumları için teşekkür ediyorum. Biraz uzatıyorum ki taksınlar diye. <gülüyor> evet. e, Doktor Zülfikar Cebe, Batman Tabip Odası Başkanıyım. E, Batman e, konuklar açısından hani belki biraz e, ülkenin doğu yakasında Suriye, Irak, İran üçgenine yakın, sık e, 2012'den beridir e, Irak'tan ee, özellikle 2014 e, Ağustos'unda IŞİD'in, e, IŞİD vahşetinin e, ezidlere yönelik e, uygulamalarından sonra çok hızlı bir e, Irak'tan e, örneğin Batman için 3500'e çok kısa bir sürede varan e, sığınmacının e, olduğu 2012 sonrası da 14 bine yakın Suriye vatandaşının, Suriye Cumhuriyeti vatandaşının e, göç ederek e, sığınma için e, zor koşullarda geldiği bir il Batman ve son 3-4 aydır da e, yaklaşık 3500 civarında şu an için bölgede yaşanan e, savaş halinde iş çatışmalardan kaynaklı Cizre Sulopi e, başta olmak üzere gelen iç göç sebebiyle gelen e, insanların sığındığı ve nüfusu 400 bin olan bir kentten bahsediyorum. Ee, öncelikle e, tabi ezidler konusunda aslında avukat arkadaşım söyledi ben de e, çok e, zaman kısıtlığından ama olabildiğince e, anlaşılabilmesi açısından da spot birkaç şey söyleyeceğim. İşte bu Cenevre Sözleşmesi'ne coğrafi kısıtlama e, şartının ülkemiz tarafından konması e, aslında başlı başına bir ayrımcılıktır. İşte konuşmacılar bahsettiler. E, ayrımcılık ve ırkçılık bir hastalıktır. Bir insan hak ihlalidir. E, yine meslektaşım ifade etti. E, e, tabip Birliği'nin, Türk Tabipler Birliği'nin tabip odalarının e, bu ülkede hükümetle beraber e, sığınmacılar konusu dahil olmak üzere sağlık hizmeti sunumlarında paralel düşünmediğini ve beraber hizmet öğretmediklerini ifade ettiler. E, doğrudur. E, i̇yi ki de öyledir. 
E, i̇yi ki de e, Türk Tevkikleri Birliği Tabip Odaları bu ülkede sağlık hizmet sunumunu e, hükümetle beraber yapmıyorlar, beraber düşünmüyorlar, meselelere paralel bakmıyorlar. Çünkü bu ülkenin e, mevcut hükümetinde, bakın ezidilerle ilgili e, hemen e, sorduğunuz soruya da cevap vereyim. Sığınmacılar ve savaş koşullarından kaçan insanlarda doğum oranları artıyor. Bizim elimizdeki veriler en azından e, Batman'da 2000 kişilik tamamen yerel belediyenin halkın ve sivil toplum örgütlerinin imkanlarıyla korunmuş olan ezidi yaşam alanında, kampında elimizdeki veriler, e, elimde birçok istatistik veri de mevcuttur. E, çünkü orada 2 yıla yakın bütün sağlık hizmetini e, Batman Tabip Odası, aktivistleri e, tarafından düzenli bir poliklinik hizmetiyle verildi. Çünkü hükümetin, Sağlık Bakanlığı'nın işte bahsedilen geçişi koruma yönetmeliğinin Ekim 2014'te yayınladığı ve odamızın 4 Kasım 2014 tarihinde kamuoyuna deklare ettiği Tabipler Birliği sayfasında da mevcuttur. E, ayrımcılıktan kaynaklı olarak ezidi insanlar aslında inançlarından dolayı e, sağlık hizmeti kapsamına alınmadılar ve ta ki Türk Tabipleri Birliği'nin Meslek örgütünün, insan hakları kuruluşların, baroların, insan hakları derneğinin çalışmaları sonucu Şubat 2015 günü e, resmi gazetede geçici koruma yönetmeliği kapsamına alınmaksızın sadece sağlık hizmetlerinden acil haller ve toplumun e, sağlık göstergelerini tehlikeye düşecek bulaşıcı hastalıklar yönünden olmak üzere bir e, geçici e, durum e, İzlediler için çıkarıldı. Biz bunu da 31 Mart 2015 tarihinde bunu deklare edip bu hükümetin ayrımcı yaklaşımını kınamıştık. Ben çok özetle 2000 kişilik Batman'ın aslında tarihi olarak da bir ezidi köyü olan tarihte Korukhe denilen köyünde ki hijyen eğitiminden tutalım. Ee, insanların burada kültürel farklılık konusunda biz ne uyuz ve bit ilacı bulmakta ne bunların tanısını koyma, koymakta hekim olarak bir zorluk çekmedik Avrupa'daki meslektaşlarımız gibi. Çünkü yerel halkımız da zaman zaman yaşanan yoksulluk, eşitsizlikler ve çatışma ortamından kaynaklı olarak bu hastalıklarla, enfeksiyon hastalıklarıyla boğuşmakta ve biz hekim olarak çok tanıdık e, bildiğimiz şeyler ve ilaç stoklarımızda da bu konuda maalesef bir sıkıntımız olmadığını ve bu hastalıklarla aşina olduğumuzu ifade etmek isteriz. Şimdi e, burada e, aile planlaması hizmetleri dahil olmak üzere birçok sağlık hizmetini, aşılama hizmetlerini e, ve e, rutin poliklinik hizmetlerinin tamamını Batman Tabip Odası, Batman Eczacılar Odası, Batman Sağlık Emekçileri Sendikası ve Batman Belediyesi desteğiyle sürdürdük. Bu süre içerisinde yasal olarak e, bu insanlara e, hükümet tarafından bir sağlığa ulaşım hakkı tanınmamaktaydı. E, bu süre sonunda e, mevcut durum için söyleyeyim bugün için ezdilerin birçoğu Avrupa'ya e, geri dönerek Şengale ve e, Federe Irak Kürt bölgesine geri dönüşlerle beraber şu an için Batman'da 200 civarında ezdi insan yaşamakta. Suriye'de gelen insanlar için de durum hakeza böyle. Biz iki tur düzeyinde gönüllü sağlık hizmeti sunarak Batman Tabip Odası aktivistleri olarak kazamık ve polio salgınlarına karşı hem kentin kenar mahallelerine yerleşmiş Suriyeliler hem yerel halka iki tur şeklinde mop-up diye tanımlanan Tabii ki aşı desteğinin bakanlık tarafından sağlandığı bir aşılama hizmetini de yürüttüğümüzü çok kısaca ifade etmek isterim. Bu anlamda mesele hekim olarak yaşadığımız coğrafyada sadece sağlık hizmeti sunmakla bitmiyor. İnsanların barınma, beslenme gibi problemleri çok yoğun devam ettiği için bu gelen insanlar çok zor koşullarda geldikleri için bir ara ülkeden değil direkt sıcağı sıcağına büyük kitleler halinde yığılama ile geldikleri için yine bir hekim duyarlılığıyla tabip odamız karanlığa karşı aydınlığı savunuyoruz sloganıyla bir yardım kampanyası hesabı açmıştık ve 50 bin civarında nakdi yardımı da o dönem sıcağı sıcağına bu insanların e, temel ihtiyaçları için kullanmıştık. Ben e, çok özetle Sığınmacılar konusunda Türk Tabipleri Birliği olarak, Batman Tabip Odası olarak, tabipler ve hekimler olarak bu ülkenin e, aydınlık geleceği için bizler tabii ki sonuçları itibariyle yaşanan sığınmacılar sorununa, e, göçler meselesine e, çözüm bulmaya çalışacağız. Sonuçları üzerinden insanların problemlerini çözeceğiz ama benim e, gördüğüm asıl bunların 
e, birer sonuç olduğunu unutmadan hekimlikte biliyoruz esastır koruyucu olmak, koruyucu hekimlik yapmak. Onun için barış talebini, savaşsız sömürüsüz bir dünya talebini de haykırmak gerektiğini bütün dünya e, tabip birlikleri içinde bu talebimizi e, iletmek istiyorum. Teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you so much for this and I think we can totally agree that we have to uh, work for peace as well and, and uh, as uh, organizations we do play a role to raise our voice for that. Um, do we have here? <laughs> we are. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, listening to it, you can, and listening to what was in the morning, I think that on one hand, everyone here can agree um, that there is a lot to do. Um, some things were already done. Probably there is a lot more that can be done. But my main thing is, after listening to everybody and reading a little bit in the press, it's very worrying the future. Because as you've said, you hear more and more a tendency of people moving away from welcoming, understanding, sympathetic to what's happening. And I think people are becoming much more, uh, um, they have much more apathy in one sometimes, but they also become indifferent. Um, it's when you see the same thing over and over, I think that people are saying, okay, so we see another little boy washed on, up on the shores. And what I really would like to ask is what do you think or feel that we can do? I don't know, preferably at least to stop this trend, which might be much, much worse soon. And we didn't even hear uh, everything. And maybe even to turn it back around. And I do agree that as physicians, uh, we usually, uh, physicians usually have a very strong role in society. And people listen to what they have to say. But I feel that we are losing uh, public opinion about this. Uh, and people are saying, okay, let's worry about our problems, our rationing, the fact that maybe we don't have, uh, uh, we have long waiting lists and we have problems, so how could we be looking at all this? And, and I was wondering if you can share a little bit with, with us what, what your thoughts are for the future. Uh, it depends on what he says. Yes. Go on. <laughs> yes, it, it is extremely worrying for the future because if you see the deterioration of public opinion in my country, in my home country, within half a year, you must be worried about the future. To give you a brief example, the rate of criminality amongst refugees has risen by 0.0.0 something. But the rate of right-wing opposition with burning down asylum seekers' houses, with uh, attacking asylum seekers, has risen by 40 or 50 percent. So in society, there is what we in Germany call, and please excuse the name, a rat race. Because it is the people who these days already, Germans, others, rely on public substitution of money, of housing, of living, who are afraid of asylum seekers because they will come into a competitive race with these over the little money that society has over for the deprivated parts of our society. This we feel very strongly. And this is one of the big problems. And therefore, for the future, our politicians, and I think they go the right way, though maybe not far enough, came to the conclusion we have to solve the problems where they started. We will never be able to solve the problem for deprivated people that have come to Germany. It is impossible to assimilate or amalgamate all these people and to integrate them all. We still have taxi drivers in Berlin who are third generation Turks who still speak German, although already their parents were born in Germany, who still speak with a Turkish accent. 
we simply have to accept that and therefore the political idea of the European Union to assist countries like Turkey with 3 billion euros to finance whatever happens here and of course to stop wars and to find positions where people don't have to leave their home countries is in the long run much more effective than just giving aid and health care to migrants and refugees that have come to our country. And the second thing is how do we treat those that are already there? I have heard you talk about Yazidis, that is one religious group. I have to confess, before this crisis, I never knew what a Yazidi <laughs> was. We believe in this principle of equality of men. And therefore, in our first reception centers, which normally house as a maximum 700 people, we put together Muslims from Albania with Yesidis, with Muslims from Algeria, with Christian people from wherever over the world. And we didn't allow them to work. And they were living under bad, overcrowded conditions and they had very little money. And we were very much astonished when they started to fight each other and started to be more criminal than others. It is our own fault, because we have to consider how, how we can treat these people so that they have a chance to integrate and assimilate. And I think we can do a lot of things internally. And. Um, the final point is we have to discuss this in our own societies and I mean, I'm, I'm looking at our Swedish colleague, if you have Sveriges Demokraterna in, in Sweden, we have a new party which out of nothing will probably get over the 10% mark in the next elections which are next in, in, on the 13th of March in several states of Germany and their main concern is to stop refugees coming into the country. But we have to, we don't have to accept that, but we have to take it into consideration and we have to do something against these political movements. Thank you, Montgomery. Uh, we have, um, we are over our time, actually, now, but a I just, comment here. I just want to ask a, a short comment. I agree with what you say, but I also feel in Switzerland we are um, coming out of our comfort zone a little bit and a lot of people want to help really and, and the NGOs who help refugees, they are overrun by people who really want to do something. So I see the other side too, that a lot of people really kind of wake up and see this is uh, something we have to fight for and it's our concern that things go well this way. So I think there is also a positive side of it. Thank you. I think the key words will be the, the ability to integrate uh, in our uh, societies and to move onto the labor market, for example. Uh, now you will be able to move out for coffee. We'll have a coffee break for half an hour or 25 minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs>